All right, so good evening, everybody. Glad you're able to make it. Uh, my name is Justin Bartholomew, and I'm here to talk about the building project, 712 building project. Um, and the best way to start talking about this is just go an overview about the building project, why we are where we are. Uh, if you've seen this presentation before, this is a slide I've used from the beginning because it does a really good job, the history of everything. And I know Mr. Seymour, who's here in the audience, had a great quote in the paper that I thought was, it was very meaningful. And it talked about the monumental times in Pawtucket's history uh, where certain dates had huge impact on our communities. And that first one would be right around 19, would be 1952 when Groveland and West Newbury decided, hey, we need to get together and we need to find, form a regionalized school district uh, so that we can combine our high schools, uh, or we can create a high school and middle school. And then Merrimack jumps in two years later uh, into all three towns end up building the current building, the high school and middle school, because when it was built in 56, it was actually a 7 to 12 building. So that was the first monumental time period. Another monumental time period was back in 1999, and that's when the vote came up for a new high school. And that high school was proposed over in Merrimack, and it was to, gonna seat about 1,000 students, just over 1,000 students. And it's interesting because here we are building a 7 to 12 building for 965 students. Uh, but that 1999, that did not pass. And when that did not pass, we were bounced out of the MSBA process, was, was called the SBA process for a long time. And it wasn't until February of 2015 that we were able to get back into the process. So a couple things that's, that are really important to note about being accepted in the MSBA's process. One, it's not easy to do. There were over 80 applicants, and the number of accepted projects was in the teens. So just because you apply, you don't get in. And, and Pawtucket had been applying all along. And another factor, in order to get in, there has to be something that they see as problematic that they were willing to take you on at, as a as a school to do repairs or to do a whole brand new building. In our case, it's a whole brand new building because they saw that their infrastructure uh, was so poor. So that four years is important to keep in mind as well because it takes three years to build this building. So it is seven years from the point of acceptance until students enter into that building. That's a long time to wait. And if this doesn't work out, We'll be waiting a long time to get back into the MSBA process. And then once we get back in, it'll be seven more years after that. Uh, if you haven't done a walkthrough of the school building, don't worry. We actually had recorded a whole walkthrough with Merrimack Cable. Uh, and if you go on to our Twitter, I'm sorry, if you go on to Pentucket RSD, or at Pentucket RSD, sorry, it's Twitter, you can see there's a, there's a tweet there that I put out there with the Merrimack um, the link for the Merrimack Cable TV that does a whole walkthrough. So please take a look at that because I think anybody who might be on the fence about whether or not this has to happen, I think that is a, a very important video so you understand kind of the infrastructure issues we're talking about. So after that acceptance, we go through a series of community meetings. We are talking to community members about what are they, what are they looking for in a school. And initially, this project that we're talking about now is just going to be a high school project. But the state came back and said, look, we want you to look at a 712 as well. Because the reality is your middle school is not, th not that much younger than your high school. And it's made of the same, same uh, materials and it's going to have the same problems. And if you don't put in for both, you're going to come to us now, you're going to go to your taxpayers now. And then not many years later, you're going to come to us again and you're going to go to your taxpayers again and we are not confident that all of that will pass. But even from an educational standpoint, it seemed to make sense because if you've attended our school district, uh, any grades, 7 through 12, you'll see kids moving back and forth between the buildings every period because we share classrooms, we share teachers back and forth every single period. So putting everybody under one roof makes an incredible, lot of an incredible amount of sense. So through all those vision sessions where you're getting feedback from the community, we came up with eight different building possibilities, everything from repair to a renovation, to a renovation in addition, to a nine, just a 912, through up through a 712. So we went through all variations. There were eight different types. And overwhelmingly, the feedback that came from the community was they wanted what was called the courtyard model. 
which was a 712 building. And that's the building we have now. So in the summer, that was decided, and we submitted to the MSBA the desire of the community to have that, and it just, the MSBA approved, us, pr approved that the end of October. It was October 31st, in fact. So at that point in the summer, there were numbers that were coming out about everyone's going to be paying $1,000 and it's going to be 155 plus million. Those are all based on ideas. No pencil has been put down to do details about any bit of the building. It's a general concept. But in February, we got about a fifth of the way through. So now you actually have an idea of what is going to be in the building or what's going to be, how it's going to be built. At that point, estimates are done again, but now they're more accurate. So when you see that change in price take place, that's why the change takes place. And even now, as more time goes on, if we do another estimate, we'll even have more accurate numbers. But we're only about 20% of the way through right now. So that's what happened in February. April, so two weeks ago, two weeks ago yesterday, we were back in Boston meeting with the MSBA, um, and the MSBA approved our budget and scope. So they gave us the nod, yes, you can do this, and we are going to give you $52.7 million to put towards this project. Now, we only get that $52.7 million if we get six yes votes in the town. If we get one no vote of those six, that $52.7 million is gone. We don't get that, and anything we do, we're going to be on our own. So that's what happened in April. And I think another important thing um, in April, so you'll see this number 52.7, that's the minimum grant. We actually, that grant could get as high as $54.1 million, which doesn't seem like a lot, but $1.4 million to me, that's a lot of money. Uh, so that's, that's a maximum that we can get up to. And it's a little complicated about how you get there, but for sure, 52.7. And all along in this process, we've tried to make sure that we go with very conservative numbers. We don't want surprises. We don't want anybody to be surprised. And it's hard to do this because people want hard, fast numbers. We don't have those. What we have are pretty close ballparks. Uh, so that's what we've been going with all along. So of course, that brings us to now, looking at the watch, and I'm seeing that we have April 25th, so four days from now, is when town meeting takes place. Town meeting is when folks, all three towns will meet. This is an article that's going to be voted on whether or not uh, we should move forward to put it on the ballot. So April 29th is town meeting. It has to pass it all three. If it passes all three, it will appear on the ballot. It will appear on the ballot and it has to pass in all three on the ballot as well, and that's on May 6th. So you need six passing votes in order for this project to be approved. Um, so that's kind of the history of where we've been. And I would, again, bring this back to this is now our third significant monumental time period in our school's history when it term, when regards to the facility itself. So why are we even, why are we looking at the school? So if you've not been in the building, or if you've only ever been at Pentucket High School or in the Pentucket Middle School, I would encourage you to go to any building around us, uh, high school or middle school around us, and just do a comparison. But here's just, and, and I'm going to show you a series of pictures. And I know it's hard for some people, but take my word for it. I, these are not an exception to the rule. These are the rules. So this is our electricity that we've got flowing in here. Right here, this little Y here, upside down Y, that is the equivalent of what's on a telephone pole inside of our building. That should not be inside of our building, but it is. And as you can note, there's all sorts of wires. This is actually the power that powers both the high school and it also powers the middle school. What's interesting is that right outside here, this, this we call this room the vault. The room is called the vault because there are blast doors right in front right here to close us up so people do not walk in here. You, do, you don't go into this area with the amount of electricity that's there. Um, but it's got blast doors there. Right outside here, there's, a, there's the control panels with all the fuses. And also, up around the outside of here is the natural gas line that's, that's coming around through. And inside, you'll see some pictures of uh, some highly corroded pipes, which is our steam heat. Uh, so just to recap, 
we have electricity, corroding pipes that are carrying water, and you also have um, natural gas. So three things all in one small space. Blast door is right here. And getting into the what's called the apparatus room, which contains all those things, there's blast doors there as well. There's as well. So in 1956, when this opened up, they knew that there was a potential for a problem, so they put the blast doors up there for a reason. There actually was an explosion underneath the ground, underneath the counselor's room a couple of years ago, and you know it was okay. There, no one gets hurt, um, but it's a, it's an issue with electricity that someone has to go through, manage. And it's, you have to be very careful, and it's a, quite a bit of work. This is just a regular outlet. Um, and I've said this before. If this is the wiring you have in your house, you might want to have that looked at. That wiring, that's the insulation that goes around there. If you touch that, it falls apart because it's so old. And as you know, if you touch wires together, that ends up being very bad. Uh, it causes all sorts of issues. You can short things out, or you can start fires. So here's some of the pipes that are in the apparatus room that's right next door. And you, you can see all the corrosion here. So some folks have said or asked, um, look, why can't we just replace these pipes with new ones? That's a great question. The answer to that is this pipe is not, like I said, it's not the exception. It is the rule. So if you were to replace this, you have to find pipe that's not corroded somewhere to attach to. We don't know where that is. You could be going 10 feet. You could be going 50 feet. But as soon as you start doing that, you're going through concrete walls and you're going through asbestos. So all of a sudden, a small, what should seem like a simple project, becomes a massive project. And this is only one valve. In that room, if you watch the video, in that room alone, I think there's about 20 or so valves. Um, so this is just one single one in this room. And there's another room that has more valves. Uh, so that's kind of the issue. And, and you can see here, there's, um, these are obviously not the same ones, but it's, again, it's just corrosion all over the place. It's steel. It's cast iron steel. It's water. When you combine those two things, you're going to have rust. These, these have been existing for 63 plus years. What was a four-inch pipe, it's like your heart and your cardiovascular system. You start to collect plaque. That four-inch pipe becomes three inches, becomes two and a half inches, and when that happens, pressure changes. Your blood pressure changes. It's not different with this system. It's the same exact situation. Difference is, like a living organism, this has had several heart attacks. It's had several bursts, several, several breaks. Uh, Mr. Seymour, who again is here, he tells his story better than I do, but a quick summary, he comes in at about 6.30 in the morning, goes into his office, which is right above this room, and these are all in the same room, which is right above this room. It's hot in his office all the time because this heat radiates an incredible amount of heat, so it's hot anyway, but he's also, it's become like a sauna. So he goes downstairs and sees some water coming out underneath the second set of blast doors goes in, and it's just all a cloud of smoke. It's like a shower on steroids. Like, it's just steam all over the place. You have electricity in there with natural gas. Guess is that probably happened about 610, 615, because if that had happened on the weekend, we're not functioning right now. That's going to be something that we put us out of commission, potentially permanently. Um, so just... That, this is one of the reasons. Another big reason, again, we talk about the pipes, we talk about the corrosion. This happens all the time. This is the main pipe. Uh, so this is another, again, just a regular pipe. These are not, um, they're, the, they're, the, they're the rules. They're not the exception. This is 113. This is a pipe. This is the main water line that comes from West Newbury and goes to the high school and to the middle school. This was our main water source for our building. In fact, it was the only water source for the building. Uh, it was the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, and it burst. And in the 113, a, few, a huge frost heave formed. And when that formed, someone happened to be driving over with a thing of coffee, happened to be a West Newbury uh, officer, hit a bump that shouldn't have been there, looked back, called it in, and sure enough, we started having to dig a hole right away. That was not repairable. We no longer can pull water from West Newbury. 
And that is a pipe that goes all the way across the street, uh, on, right about on the, on the Groveland, West Newbury border. There's a junction building. The water comes all the way from there, all the way to the high school. We cannot use West Newbury's water at this point. There's too much corrosion. So what happened was a result, there's a fire hydrant that no longer functions by the football field. And there's no water access to the football field. So they throw a garden hose from the high school over the roof. And that goes down along a chain link fence and, and hooks into the snack shack uh, so that they can meet health code and serving food. Um, fortunately, when this was designed, they were very wise about water sources. That junction building also has a water supply from Groveland. So right now, we are functioning purely on Groveland's water. We have no access any longer to West Newbury's water. So fast forward two years, or less than two years, and we've got, actually, I'm going to rewind this uh, two years before that. Here's another pipe underneath the nurse's office causes this huge flood. And this flood, uh, it was, went all the way and destroyed. If you ever drove by, there were four modular units outside in front of the high school. This was the third and last time that those were flooded uh, because they'd been so badly damaged, not from this, but from the previous two floods, that they had to tear them down. Uh, so those that moved in and then the auditorium there was a tremendous amount of mud silt water and there was damage there as well um, And again, this is right underneath the nurse's office was in here The only reason and thankfully there was a patrol that was going through and they were monitoring and They saw water coming under the door and they called it in had they not done that had it been a couple hours later yeah, again we, we may not be having school there right now um, but that's just, that is the reality of the situation. This is a massive cleanup. That's students out of the building, and that's huge repairs. So I'll go to this. I talked about Groveland's main water line. Well, here's a picture, and you can kind of see this is what I ran into in January. I had Bob Danforth shows up and looks at me. He says, uh, I need you to come with me. I said, what is it? He said, I, I just need to get in the truck. So I hopped in the truck, drove down to the front of the middle school, and I'm looking at this, and I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. So let me just actually have this. I said this quite a bit uh, at a lot of meetings. I ha actually have this on video. So I'm going to just show you the video since I do have the video. So here we are, January 15th, and this is the main line going to middle school, which will also cause us to shut off high school. Just caught it, so we're working on it. So here we are, January 15th, and this is the main line. Going to middle school, which will also cause us to shut off high school. Just caught it, so we're working on it. So I would, I would just, yeah, that is outside. So my first question to Bob Danforth is, is this our problem? Are we paying for this? Or is it Groveland's? And it turned out it was four feet onto 113, so it was Groveland's. But it was, it's our pipes, right? These are the pipes that were put in for the school building. This is what happens outside the building. This is what happens inside the building. That is not normal school procedure for any school building. And the damage that gets done when this isn't caught early is excessive. Again, this is, so that was January. Here we are in March. So again, you talk about uh, cardiovascular system and, and plaque and, and building up cholesterol, and you start having a, a little minor heart attacks. Well, here we go. This is a little sinkhole that's due to poor drainage and the pipe underneath. That was formed while we were at a working, we were at a work group meeting. It was a Thursday, March 20th, so it was, what, that four weeks ago, four or five weeks ago. We get a phone call in, in pictures saying, look, student just turned this in, and there it is. What's crazy about this is that 20 feet away, down over here, where, the, where students and parents, parents pick up and they exit out, in the middle of the road was another identical sinkhole that we had just fixed two weeks before. So again, glad my car wasn't on there. Glad the student didn't get hurt, but this is what, we, this is what we're working with. So inside a science uh, lab, again, I would really encourage you, uh, Pen at Pentucket RSD, go look at the video of the tour. 
you'll get a great idea of the uh, science labs. But here's a, here's a science lab. This is the original part of the building. This is actually uh, a hood that's been brought in uh, because the old hood long since uh, lost its uh, use. It's hooked up and there's a switch. So the teacher has to stand up on the counter here to put the switch on and then there's a fan there. Uh, OSHA would not like this. This is not good protocol, right? You don't have uh, to do that. Over here, and I want you to consider, lots of repairs, you can see them, right? Lots of repairs. This was built in 1956. I taught in this classroom for two periods. That is 63 years of hair, bubble gum, and who knows what else going down those pipes. When I arrived to teach in, two, in 1998, we had, were had storing chemicals that were no longer allowed to be in the school building because they damage a lot of things. Not the least amongst is, is certain chemicals in piping is not good or metals are not good. So those inevitably ended up down the sink years before. Now obviously, we properly disposed of them back in the 60s and 70s. So we're out. These are in, just in constant repair. And by the way, all these countertops, this is that same classroom. And that was the pipe right there. And you can see there's the, there's the hood with the fan. But I want you to count up. We teach science. We do a pretty dang good job of it, too. One lab table, two, three, four, and five. So we put two kids at each table, two times five, ten kids. Pentucket Regional High School does not have the luxury of having 10 kids in a class for science. 20 would be wonderful, It'd be great. Teachers would be ecstatic if they had 20. So if you've got 10 kids in lab, you have 10 kids here not participating or you're cramming that lab space. The state would never allow this in a science classroom that they built, never. In fact, the design they have, and you'll see in a little bit, is sinks all around, all of these desks, all this space is open and flexible. They're all on wheels so they can move them around. Because as the teacher, some things I might want you to be back there, other things I might want you to be around. All of this is fixed. These have since moved, so th these are movable, but all of these are fixed. And take a guess, this sturdy countertop, which hasn't changed in 63 years. Why do you think this is sturdy? It's because it's composed of asbestos. All these countertops and the floors. Now this was the classroom I taught most in, and I took, I was a student here as well. And again, I was, this was a biology classroom. It was when I was taking class. It was when I was teaching class. So here, they used to be fixed. And you can see now uh, they've moved them. If I'm teaching a lab in here, and we have a lot of wet labs in biology, a lot of wet labs in biology, let's count the sinks. One. One sink. You're not doing a wet lab in a biology room, which means you're not doing wet labs at all. So you're very restricted here with what you can do. And I will say, this classroom of science classrooms of the old wing, this is the, this is the nicest of the classrooms. Uh, the physics rooms, again, got to watch. please watch the video. They're puny. They're absolutely puny. You'll see an example here. So in the new part of the building, this is just uh, some of the issues that we have. This was the, res the building, this building addition finished in 1995. Um, and I say this often, we showed it on tours. You can see the water, but we have the system above the drop ceiling that captures all of the leaks. So the roof leaks all the time. I think Greg had and their facilities director said, when it rains outside, it's drizzling inside. So we have a tarp above this drop ceiling and it funnels down and it connects to this hose and the hose drops all the water into the bucket. That prevents us from having to repair all of these ceiling tiles. And you can go up on the roof and you can repair the leak that you think it is, but another leak's gonna appear somewhere else and it drops down and it'll follow the same, same pattern or go somewhere else. Um, so that's just kind of our way of making the correction. This one bugs me quite a bit. So this system here gives access to, to students, teachers, or visitors who are handicapped. Gives them access to the bottom floor, gives them access to the top floor. It does not work, 
and it's a violation of the, of, uh, the fire marshal will not allow us to operate it because it's not, doesn't allow for proper egress width. So what you have, if you have a student or teacher that has, is supposed to be having a class upstairs or down, we don't have the class there. We have to move that class to a part of the building that's accessible. Just fundamentally, as a public educator, not having access to your entire building for anyone is wrong. So the gym, <laughs> there's a lot of games now in the afternoon. This is our solution for the solar, solar glare that streams on through in the afternoons. We've gone ahead and put on the inside a tarp. On the outside, we've got a tarp as well. That helps prevent the sun from coming in. Um, you know, back when this was built in 63, sure the sun came in as well, but the glass was a little bit newer, could probably do a little bit better job refracting the light. In this instance, uh, we have a lot more games on the weekends. Youth leagues are using it, uh, so it gets pretty busy. Over at the middle school, this classroom looks perfectly fine. This is actually, I have, uh, as many of you know, uh, I just moved back here from North Carolina. But my, so my children are all attending in Pentucket. Where else are they going to go? So my daughter had, is in this classroom. This is uh, Leo Parents, Coach Parents classroom. So we had a situation where water had, there was a leak in the roof. We fixed that leak, but water had trickled down the back of the classroom and went underneath the tiles. It wasn't on top, it was underneath the tiles. Problem with that is it compromises the adhesive holding the tiles down. And those tiles are asbestos. So what we did not want to have happen is a tile to loosen, having adults and children, hundreds in a day, stepping on it, and then it breaks, and then we have a health problem. So we closed this room altogether. We will abate this room. We'll do an asbestos abatement. But to do an abatement in the middle of the year would require us to shut down a whole bunch of classrooms. And that's just that we can't do that. So here's a, this is just how we run our, uh, we, everyone needs connectivity. Like kids are one to one in the middle school now and it's bring your own device at the high school. So in order to do that, you need to have Wi-Fi connections and this is how we run our access points. Um, you get creative. I actually had a gentleman in one of the tours uh, suggest, well, why don't we run, a, put in a new system, a new HVAC system, since that's our Achilles heel, why don't we just put a new HVAC system with new boilers and we'll run pipes down the same way we run that down. Okay, uh, we could do that. I'd be curious to know what the fire inspector has to say about that. But even if they approved it, we can't because it costs too much money. When I say cost too much money, it's far cheaper than a building project, but we will exceed a certain threshold, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which will then cause us to make everything compliant or make it ADA compliant, which as soon as we start getting involved in that, we'll have to make everything else compliant. And all of a sudden, you're talking about a repair of over $70 million. Another one in the middle school. This was this is an office space. This is a flood that was in the beginning of the year. Again, you can see the, the roofing tiles and coming down. And we repaired it, and here it is again later on in the year. It's just the reality of what we're in. And do roofs leak in buildings? Yes. Do they re leak this frequently? No. They do in our buildings but not in any other building I've been in. We, I've seen lots of different buildings, different ages, um, but not this frequently. And again, these are just a select few of um, what we see on a consistent basis. So we talked about why can't we fix. So there's an assessed value of any building, of your house, there's an assessed value. So the high school's assessed value is $12.1 million. And the middle school's assessed value is $3 million. So we have to be below a 30% threshold to do any repairs, to do any modifications to the building. The building. We can do as much as we want to the outside. If we wanted to put in a whole stadium and all sorts of fancy fields, we could do that as long as we make it compliant. But we cannot touch these buildings with anything over, for the high school, $3.6 million and for the middle school, $1 million. So that new HVAC system, if we could do it all ourselves, would be about $6 million. If you tried to replace the current HVAC system and all the pipes that are corroding on the inside of the interior of the walls, that we 
project out just over $9 million to $11 million because you now are involving abatements and going through uh, foundations. So we know that if that HVAC does have a problem, a catastrophic failure, then we're moving on to our contingency plan. And our contingency plan is purposely put in place. It's, I mean, it's a smart thing to have no matter what. We saw the need for it seven years ago with Donahue. We saw the need for it last year with Page where you had fold and students had to move around. Uh, you don't want students in a situation where they, they don't know where they're going to school, they're not comfortable. And if the adult in the classroom is not comfortable, the kids aren't going to be comfortable. So we have a plan in place to help that transition go smoothly. Uh, for the high school, if the high school fails, all the high school students go down into the middle school. And the middle school re middle schools return to their elementary schools. Uh, so here in Grove and Bagnell, Bagnell would make that extremely tight. Doable, but tight. Page, not a problem. Merrimack, not a problem. They could handle it. Um, the high school is a bit of a problem. You're now confined to one single gym, a much smaller auditorium, no real art classes. There's rooms which we turn into art classes, which is what we've done in the high school already anyway with some existing spaces. But the fundamental problem is we have 48 classrooms meet during one of the periods and 47 classrooms meet during a second period. Even when we convert the cafeteria into two additional classrooms, so we take half of the cafeteria corner, divide that into half, one half of it, divide half, so you have a quarter, quarter to half, those two become classrooms and the old band room becomes three classrooms. We can only make 44 classrooms. So we're still shy, four classrooms and three classrooms and the reality is we'll do what we do. We'll improvise and try to figure out a way to make it happen. Um, because I mean, the kids have to be educated and we have to educate them. So big question, what does the new building look like? Uh, you've heard about the structural issues. Um, I, you know, Honestly, we've not run into anyone who looks at these and says, yeah, these aren't a problem. There's one gentleman who, who claimed he could bring someone in on a Saturday morning and fix it for $90,000 all these bolts. Oh, he said he could fix all the bolts for, and we knew the answer. We said, just for the bolts though, and as soon as that breaks, you're now into a multi-million dollar project. Um, but, but again, we, we've researched this quite a bit, and I've been impressed uh, upon my return of understanding how much Greg Haddon in particular has a, as a picture, and Greg Haddon's our facilities director, the picture he has of the entire, not just the high school, middle school, but all the schools, their infrastructure, their issues, because we, prior to him, did not have someone doing that. So when someone says we could have fixed this 30 years ago, great. No one would have known about it. If there was a plumbing problem, you would have called up a local person, they would have come and fixed that problem, and then, they're, then they go back. They're not aware of all these other issues that are going on because there's, there's no one seeing all that. There's no one viewing all that. So what will the new building look like? We had, a, had a, uh, our students at the high school, we, I used to show like four uh, different videos, but our students at the high school were able to take these videos and mesh them together for one video so people don't have to hit play. Uh, and they changed the, the music, which is great because I've been listening to the same song now for the last uh, three and a half months. So here is that video. I'll talk you through some of the pieces of this. High school portion right here, three floors, middle schools right here, two floors, and that's the gymnasium. That center part right here is receptionists, counselors, administrator offices, there's secure entrances, one for the high school here, the middle school on the other side. downstairs and upstairs as well. And middle school and high school could have different lunches. So middle school students would have lunch uh, during a couple of periods, and high school would have lunch during a couple of periods as well. All that furniture is movable, so when you do have a performance, you can have an action. 
virtual lobby where people can go out for intermission. spaces right here. And again, this would be the middle school. These top two floors of the middle school. And the high school, top three floors, all down this side. The admin offices we took out of the project, that's going to stay. That saved us several million dollars. construction process, how it would progress from start to finish. So this is going to be parking. The number of parking spaces that's in temporary parking is actually the same number of spaces we currently have at the school. watch here as they put in the footings. This is where our current boilers are. And you'll see this is the one part of the current high school that has to come down. And they'll put in a temporary heating system over here. And that will be for a few months.
at this point, the building's closed. The children would have moved into this building now. Now we're going to the demolition and abatement. The abatement then to the middle school and the high school. Note all the fields that are currently behind the middle school, those all stay. There's no changes there at all. So that is, we're about to watch a school committee meeting, so we'll get out of there. But that is um, a project that I, I, I can't emphasize this point enough, and I don't think we talked about it nearly enough. When I was in North Carolina, one of the things I learned quite a bit was that their schools are the focal points of their communities. And that's really what schools are always supposed to be. They're supposed to be representative of what the community believes in, and they're supposed to be accessed and used by all the community members. We're very aware uh, of the lack of space for senior citizens, for housing, and for places to do things. We view this building as a space for children during the school days, and then after school hours, for it to be utilized consistently. We want groups. If there's a cooking group that's out there, art group, tech, people want to come and learn about technology, and there's a tech group that's out there, we, this building is set up for that to be able to happen. I talk about quite a bit uh, when I was younger, and I think it was in the uh, junior high at the time, there was a pianist that came from the Soviet Union to perform uh, at the high school. Everyone in the community went to see that performance. Everyone. You can't do that anymore. Because now, if you're in the fall, there's a fall play. In the spring, there's a spring musical. And after that and before that, there are musical performances. And if you walk down the corridor of the cafeteria in the high school, not only is the auditorium being used, all the small rooms are being used, all of them by the kids for that one big performance. This building allows for all of those small groups to take place and for community, for community groups to come in and have access. That is really, really important to us. We don't want this just to be a building for the children. This is a building for the community. And obviously, we don't want anyone creepily walking around during the school day when there are children there. Please don't do that. That would not be appropriate. Uh, but when school's not in session, that's how we see this. We want, we are the Pentucket community. Yes, we're Grove and Western Mayor Merrimack, but together we're the Pentucket community. That is our capital. That is our focal point. So just a couple more diagrams here. This is the current uh, auditorium, and you saw the rendition. This is actually from Situate. Um, this right here, these are all new seats. These seats are now gone, and there's other seats that are gone. I was sitting right about here when my um, sixth grader was performing this winter, and I was sitting there in December, and I was sweating bullets. It was packed. There were people standing up. It was very uncomfortable. And because everyone's so focused about themselves, you couldn't really pay attention to what was going on up ahead. That's not what you want. That's not what you want when you're there watching your kids, not what you want when you're watching your students. And if I'm performing, I want you to have a good experience. I want you to hear me, and I want you to hear the talents that I'm producing. And if you notice on the, uh, on, on the video, the new auditorium is about 100 seats more, 100 seats more, and it's, everything's on top of the stage. So everyone has great views, and the acoustics would sound fabulous. This is our art room right now. If you look here, you recognize that's a type of a garage door. It is. That's where our art room is now. That garage door used to be a shop class and a auto tech class. What a modern art room looks like. So we do a good job of taking spaces that weren't what they were intended for and making them into what we need them to be. Uh, this is purpose design. I think another really important piece to recognize about the new building, 
this classroom right here has only so many things you can do in it. You're not having certain classes in here. All of the classes, all the classrooms, except for the auditorium and the gym, they're flexible spaces. They can be used for anything. You can teach earth science in any, almost any classroom. Now, there's some you can't. You're not teaching chemistry in any classroom. That would not be OK. You know, you, science classrooms are, are kind of set. But we don't know. We know technology's changed a tremendous amount because our phones have changed a tremendous amount in the last 20 years. So hasn't learning. So hasn't teaching. That curriculum delivery has greatly changed. These spaces take that into account because we don't know what curriculum delivery and st the student learning process is going to look like in 10 years. But we know flexible spaces taking that into a, take that into account. So we're not stuck with asbestos tables locked into the ground with spaces that can't be moved and can only be used for, for specific purposes. Here's one of the physics rooms. And it's not a full shot. It's just look, they're doing a very similar lab. My guess, they're probably teaching friction. But what do I know? Just, just a guess. These tables, even when I was in school, and I only graduated with 122 students, we didn't have enough space back then for students to be able to sit in the classroom space right here. So you had students that had to sit in the labs. These are fixed, the asbestos top tables. And you can see there's electrical outlets. That, that, and that's why those are fixed. This is a modern, same, physics, same type of physics classroom. Everything's movable. If I am doing a presentation, and I want everyone, or in my case, when I was doing a dissection, I would do it up at my desk, and all the kids would stand up, and they'd have to stand up and try to look. In this room, I could set up right in the middle. They can bring their desks and chairs around, move it around, and as I'm doing it, they can do it. And that's really important for the learning process. It's the whole, comp it's the whole concept of teach me how to fish. And that's how learning really excels. We talked about the Great Flood, or floods. Uh, the final flood that took out those modular buildings, we had a movement science classroom that was in there, because you don't typically have this many bikes like in, in, a, in a weight room, right? There's not many people want to hop on a, uh, on a bike like that. But the idea for movement science is you hop on there, you, you understand, you learn cardiovascular system, blood, uh, blood pressure, heart rates, and what are all the different things that impact that. So this used to be in one of those modular classrooms. And when those were torn down, they could not go, they could not be there anymore. So they get moved to the hallway. This is a ni very nice, generous donation by the Pawtucket Education Foundation, which now is in the hallway, gets used. But obviously, that's not a classroom setting. Or if it is, a, in, and when it is a classroom setting, that is not what I want for my child. That's not what I want for my children. And I can't imagine many parents or community people want this for theirs. Uh, and here is this more of a weight room, weight facility. Um, but again, you can see kind of a big difference. So the overall cost, we know because last uh, two, two Wednesdays ago, the MSBA finalized and approved the cost, $146.3 million. That's the cost of the entire building. They give us a grant of $52.7 million. Now, we follow the MSBA rules because that's how you get that grant. But the MSBA is an excellent organization. We fund that. Everyone in the state funds that when they purchase something. A small percentage goes to the MSBA so they can do projects. This is money that we are very fortunate to get, 52.7 million. If we had to do this on our own, that's all taxpayers floating the $146.3 million. So the idea of the MSBA existing is brilliant. Um, but the reality is they can only do so many projects each year. So when I talk about uh, what's a no vote mean, what's a yes vote mean, well, yes vote means this is our bill. $93.6 million, that's our bill. That's what a yes vote means. A no vote means, OK, well, that's $52.7 million we're not getting. So what are we doing? And again, when we start looking at repairs, we'll talk about that in a little bit. We'll look at a couple numbers. And again, I'm, I, this is not a, I'm not trying to Fearmonger. This is just factual reality of where we are uh, as a school district. So the MSBA, again, um, when we went a couple Wednesdays ago, we were one of four schools, 
four schools, five schools, one or five, four or five schools. Uh, and aside from one middle school, we were the cheapest of the schools that were on that agenda. Now, some of those were bigger schools. Some of them were just renovations. They weren't even uh, new builds. Um, so I think we're very fortunate to even be, in, be involved in the process. So the cost to us, what will we pay? Here's what people will pay by town. And you can see that's broken down by the annual cost, quarterly, monthly. If you want to look at daily, that's great. I think some, most people pay their taxes quarterly, I believe. Um, but again, these numbers are not set in granite. I know people want numbers to be set in granite. You cannot set numbers in granite because we don't know. We know 146.3, that's the project number. We know 52.7, that is what we're going to get. We know 93.6, that's what we will have to pay. It could be less than 93.6. Maybe it'll, it could be that we get a better interest rate and those numbers drop down. It could be that we start a huge trade war with some country that impacts, I don't know, drywall or cement or so, who knows? And all of a sudden that material goes up. So all those are possibilities. What's nice is that in this project from the beginning, we have contingencies built in to deal with those unknowns. So if there is a trade war that goes on, all of a sudden the cost of steel goes way up, we, we can accommodate that increase. Um, so those contingencies are built in. People have asked as well, is this going to be, if it were, 755 a month? Is that going to be 755 this year? And then you're going to ask for another $5 million and it's going to go up to 820 No. 755 start to finish. Once we, once we solidify and the project's done and that, start, that starts getting paid, start to finish, that is what the price is. Our job is to find whatever is cheapest for, and for the project, we want something that is optimizes the learning experience. It's durable. It will last us a long, long time. And it's easy to maintain. We don't need complex things uh, that take an incredible amount of um, management or, or facilities uh, maintenance folks going in there trying to clean or, or, or change things. So those have been our goals all along. And that's why we've cut, we had terracotta siding at one point, got rid of that, went to brick. Brick lasts a long time. It, it's easy to maintain. And it doesn't have a positive or negative impact on the learning experience. It's neutral. So that's a good product. So that's when we went through and value engineered. That's how we were able to bring those down. Those numbers, in this instance, they make these assumptions. One, your, that number is based on the number of students from each town. Growing up, Groveland was the second biggest town, and Merrimack was the biggest town. That has shifted. Groveland has grown and overtaken Merrimack for the biggest of the three towns. Um, that's also based on a non-callable bond of 2.75. We don't know what our bond rate is going to be. We know when we went out there, when we went out and put this together early uh, February, we were told uh, from our financial folks that two and a quarter is what some non-callables have been going for. So we wanted to always be conservative and put 275. And we're now, it, it might come back at two. It might come back at three and a quarter. Um, it's, we, we can't tell you for certain that that's what it's going to be. It's not possible. But we know, and if you've been paying attention to the market, that things are pretty much stable or have been stable uh, with interest rates. And then it's based on your home assessed value. And you can see there, that is what the median home values are in each town. And again, the district share is $93.6 million. So we, we started talking about this. What happens if the building project does not pass? So April 29th is town hall meeting. Sorry, geez, town meeting. Town hall meetings where you go and you have debates, you talk to the candidates and things like that. So a town meeting is, is next Monday. So on April 29th, all three go, that's great. If one town says no, it's over. There's no, the project does not go. So let's say it passes town and doesn't pass on the ballot. If there's a no vote anywhere, the project is done, the $52.7 million grant is gone. We are now on our own. It is my duty to take care of the school district and the children in it. So I have to come to each board of selectmen and request a fee, uh, um, election be done in, in uh, September to do a feasibility study 
I'm sorry, a special town meeting in, in October to do a feasibility study at the cost of $1.5 million to do immediate repairs on the high school. Going to have to do it. And we already know, because that was one of the options, the estimates done for the repair was $73.2 million to repair a building. And I just showed you the spaces. Take a tour. Do take, take that tour, uh, Pentucket RSD. Uh, find that on Twitter. Take the tour. You'll see all we're doing is making small spaces, small spaces again. We're not bringing them up to what the current level of uh, teaching and learning is. So if that gets approved, and that would have to go through the exact same process we're going through right now, three town meetings have to say yes, and then three ballot votes have to say yes for us to do the repairs. And we own that, 73.2. The MSBA, uh, people ask, well, won't the, are you sure the state won't kick in? The state's going to tell you, go ahead and do it. If you can get in somewhere along the line, that's great. But when it comes to a vote, they know you vote. We have voted no. If we have voted no, they are not go they, this is costing them money as well. So they're not going to enter in another project when they know there's just been a recent no vote. So as soon as that's done, I'm coming, or as soon as that's, and in, in, while that's in process, I'm going to come again, and I'm going to ask for repairs to be done to the middle school. And you have to bring all that up to code. And these repairs, we're not talking about a simple repair of even just taking out a pipe. I mean, that's easy compared to what we'd have to do. The hallways are not ADA compliant. You can't just take concrete blocks and, and move them. And those are load-bearing walls, and we have multiple floors. So it is a serious and significant uh, process. And also, the children, if we were building a new school, would stay in the current facility while the new school is being built. And when the new school is finished, they would move to the new facility. So all their learning still takes place in the high school. If the high school is under repair, those students are not moving anywhere except for the middle school. They'll all move into the middle school into the situation which I explained earlier. And then all the middle schools will be back down at the elementary schools for what we would expect longer than the three year it is three years uh, because you have to again you're you're pulling out you're doing all abatements all those things have to happen you're not building from the ground up you're having to work with the building that already exists so less than ideal so at the end of the day we're looking at um, that that's what would we happen in a no vote. Now, if it's a no to the new building and then a no to the repair, where does that leave us? Okay, now we're going to ride out that building, and that could be weeks, it could be months, it could be tomorrow. It could be, I, I, there's no way I could go out and say three years. I honestly, even on a yes vote, I do not believe, having walked through that building many times uh, and seen that apparatus room, that it will sustain to the point of uh, the new building being built. But uh, once something happens and we have any type of catastrophic failure, that's it. We're out of that building for good. And the middle school at that point essentially becomes the high school. And then also at that point, we start having conversations with the school committee about how do we want to deal with this, and we start looking at our long-term contingency plan. I, I as a, as a Pentucket community resident, I look at this and just scratch my head and say, is this really what we're talking about? And the answer is yes, this is. So I don't know how people feel about driving down 113 and seeing an abandoned school building. Um, and again, it sounds like it's gloom and doom. It's not. That is just the factual reality of where we are with a 63-year-old building that has served us extremely well. And we've taken a lot of time and since I've been here in July, get collect, I've taken a tremendous amount of time collecting all that information, seeing what is possible. And I, I understand what's possible. I don't know all the intricacies of engineering, um, of all the finance. I have a good, a good spectrum of knowledge about it. This is the reality of where we are. Um, so April 29th is when the town hall meeting comes and people have their first voice. And then again, uh, May 6th is going to be uh, the second time. So with that, does anybody have any questions? All right, well, I appreciate everybody coming this evening. And again, if you go on to, or for the first time, if you want to know what's, uh, not just now, 
But if the project were to pass, we have a web website. It's, it's PentucketProject.com. You can go on to PentucketProject.com. You'll see all the information, that's some of what you've seen here tonight. Uh, if the project is ongoing, if it does pass, we'll keep posts and updates about what's going on. Because, again, $146.3 million project with the community pumping in $93.6 million. Yeah, we, we have a responsibility to make sure people are brought up to speed about where things are going. Um, so if there's no other questions, I'd just like to thank you all. appreciate it. What a wonderful audience of... Let's see, when Grove Gro now, we had some big, uh, last week we had a pretty decent sized audience. Um, but I know people are probably tired of hearing my voice. So the nice thing about that is for this presentation, anyway, you won't have to hear it too many more times. Uh, but thank you all very much. I appreciate it and have a wonderful evening.